worship team. We're going to start right down with it. Right? Uh, sometimes it's going to meander a little, you're going to shake a few hands, but you're in summer mode. You're like, just, we'll sit down and we'll, we'll get into it. Uh, hey, we're in this July series uh, called You Pick It. And uh, you chose last week, uh, if you were here on Sunday, I had two subjects that had come in of your uh, suggested things, and we said, hey, if you want prayer, or you want to hear about God's will, and three of you wanted to hear about prayer, yeah. everybody else's hands went up for God's will, and so I am, if nothing else, a man of the people, and so today... <laughs> I say that because this week I did what you wanted, but uh, but we'll see what happens in the future weeks. But this week we're going to talk about the will of God in our You Pick It series. And uh, and before we get into that, right, uh, let me ask you a question. Have you ever been lost before? Like, maybe your parents lost you, maybe in the car, wherever. So some people, you've been lost before. Uh, we've lost several of our kids over <laughs> over some different experiences. And, uh, and when the older three girls were really little, we would always go uh, up to the tree farm. And uh, we always pick out trees that you can cut down yourself because uh, we love the smell of fresh trees. We love the sound of kids whining. When can we just pick the tree that we are going to take home and cut it down? Like, we're bored. We don't want to do this. And we say, listen, I had to go cut down a fresh tree when I didn't want to when I was a kid. So you will do it also. <laughs> continuing family traditions. And when we lived in Sacramento and Rio Vista, uh, we would go up to a place called Apple Hill outside of Placerville and, and go to the same place every year. And spend way too much money on a live fresh tree that would last, you know, five to six weeks. And then it's dead, making a mess in your house. And it's not the best investment of your money, but, uh, but it's what we did. And so we go up to this place, and one year we had the three girls, and they were pretty little, and we lost Chloe at the tree farm. Uh, uh, and you know, it's acres, and it's trees everywhere, and, and I imagine as a tiny little girl, like what it must have been like for her to be lost in the woods, right? Scary, separated from your parents, that feeling of loneliness and isolation, it's terrifying to get lost, right? When you're a little kid, right? A little Christmas tree farm feels like a forest and you're in the midst of the woods. And, and, and I think about that sometimes because I think for us as we go through life, if we don't know what God's will for our life is, it's like being a little kid in a Christmas tree farm, right? Where sometimes we get lost in this world and it might seem like we're lost in something bigger than what we're actually lost in, because she wasn't lost in the woods, right? There's a lot less danger at the Christmas tree farm, but, but it feels like that when you feel small and you don't know your way. So when it comes to living a life that follows Christ, we can get lost. We get lost in family decisions, career choices. We get lost in a life that goes off in a direction that maybe we've never intended. Maybe we get lost in sin. Maybe we just get lost doing something that God didn't intend for us to do. And so decisions, right, can make us feel lost. And here's what it's been said of, of sin. The number one thing I think that takes us out of God's will uh, is that sin will take you further than you want it to go, keep you longer than you want it to stay, and cost you more than you want it to pay. Right? And so if you think about that, right, sin will take us out of God's will, distract us, keep us further away from the Lord. Every single day you are faced with making decisions that direct the course of your life. Like all these micro decisions that you choose to do get you to where you are right now. When I was a youth pastor, uh, we were trying to seek God's will for some major decisions in our life about direction and where we should be in ministry next. And, and so my district youth director at the time, he gave me a list of things to pray about to discern God's will. And so I made a note in my iPhone 3S. Uh, that's how long ago. Gosh, that feels like forever ago, doesn't it? That's like 20 iPhones back. And, uh, and I still use that list of those seven things to this day. We used it in our decision-making to come here 
Um, and so it's probably better for you as a sermon series somewhere down uh, the road in the future. But today, I want to share you, with you the, the list that I personally use to, uh, to understand the will of God. So if you're taking notes, today's a good one. I sent you an email. You should maybe bring something to take notes for. But you have a phone device that can take notes. Uh, seven things to understand the will of God in your life. And if you know God's will, you will never be lost in life, all right? So you might not be where you thought you'd be, uh, but you won't be lost if you know God's will. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6 says this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him and he will make your paths straight. Interesting, right? If we trust in the Lord, we, we don't worry about what we think we know, and we submit to him, he will make your path straight. Straight. Israel is mostly a hill and mountain terrain area. If you've ever been hiking, uh, you know that flat ground is easier to travel on, right? You can go at a quicker pace. There's less obstacles, less things to worry about. And much of our lives, apart from God, feel more like hill or mountain terrain than probably just a straight walk strolling through the park. And life brings difficulty. It brings challenges. It makes us weary unfamiliar terrain in life can be disorienting, but knowing God's will takes the confusion out of decision making, uh, right? And so, so I want you to understand, sometimes we get all worked up, we get fearful, we're worried like, what if I make the wrong decision? If we know God's will, you don't have to worry, you don't have to be confused about what to do. And so, so it's really important, and I want you to understand this, when you live for following Jesus, right, our, our goal is to be transformed by the power of Christ, uh, then you don't have to make decisions for yourself anymore. When you decide, I'm going to follow Jesus, everything I do, I'm just going to live for him, I'm, I'm going to try, you don't have to decide things for yourself anymore. It's really nice. You can uh, just offload that onto the Lord and say, God, you tell me what to do and I'll just do that. And life becomes so much more simple when you follow Jesus and just do what he wants. Except when you do that, and it gives you all these things to do that require faith that you can't do on your own. And it's actually really difficult. And so, uh, so right, but you don't have to worry or wonder anymore. All you have to do is know what is the right God decision and do that. Uh, and I, I want to encourage you as well. Uh, you're not leading the hike, right? Like in, in life, uh, you're not the hike leader. You're following the leader. It's much easier to follow the one who knows how to get to the destination than being the one who charts the course. And so you're not charting the course, you're following Christ. So I think I have seven things for the will of God. We have a list, you can throw it up there. Uh, I'm going to rapid fire them off to you, and then we're going to go through all seven of these today. Uh, and here's what they are, right? The, the number one thing, the Bible will give us God's will. Number two, inner witness. Uh, or the peace of God. Number three is personal desire. Number four, mature counsel. Number five, special guidance. Six is circumstances. And seven is common sense. I'm not going to go through them exactly in that order today. Uh, and then I also have an eighth bonus one at the end that's not on the list for you that we'll throw in at the very end. And so here's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to teach it to you the same way that it was taught to me by my district youth director, how to, how to use these seven things, how to function with them. And, and so here's the thing, you have to take these seven things and you have to test them when you need to seek God's will for making big decisions. And so I want you to think of it like a traffic light, uh, right? There's a red light, a yellow light, and a green light. Red means you know it's a stop. You, you know that it's a no, right? So you can confirm, you're like, okay, this is a red light. This is definitely not what God wants. Yellow light is not like when you're driving and it means speed up, hurry, quickly get to your, your destination. Yellow means caution. It means slow down. It means continue to seek the Lord in that area. You're yielding, right? Uh, and, and so keep that in mind. Not like you're driving yellow light, but, but what it's actually meant for. And then green is a go. Green means I know that God, his blessing is on this. It, it's good to go, all right? So, so we're going to go through these seven things. Number one is the Bible. Uh, God's will will never contradict what is in the scriptures. So despite when you feel like, I think God really wants me to do this, uh, I've had literally people tell me, I think I should divorce my spouse because God wants me to be happy. 
Uh, now, I want you to stay married, maybe be happy with the person you've already committed to for life in front of the Lord and other people. And, and so, right, like, but, but, but I don't feel happy is not a qualifier for God's will. It contradicts something in the scriptures. It, your will might contradict. Your interpretation might contradict. But God will never ask you to do anything that violates the scriptures that have already been given. And so if you're seeking God's will for your life and you know the Bible says this or, or that, and you're like, oh, well, the Bible really says I shouldn't do that, then you know that's not God's will for your life. The Bible interprets the Bible, not our culture, not society, not our emotions or our feelings. The easiest way to know what God's will is is to read and understand the scriptures. So here's what the Bible says that God's will is for you. 1 Thessalonians 5, 18 says, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. All right, that's pretty cool, right? Sometimes the Bible literally says this is God's will. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3, it's God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality. Okay, like that's pretty clear, like we should live a sanctified or a holy, set-apart life and avoid sexual immorality. That's God's will for you. You don't have to wonder, should I have an affair? No, you shouldn't. It's not God's will for you to do that. Luke chapter 9, verse 23, then he said to him, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Okay? That, that's God's will. Deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow Jesus. First Peter, one final one for you today, 2 5, 2 15. Says it's God's will that by doing good you'll silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. It's God's will that you do good. Uh, some verses in the Bible literally spell it out for you. This is God's will, and so much more is inferred by the Bible, uh, saying this is how you should live. Do this, and this will be the result. And if God's word says live in a certain way, we can know the will of God, and then we can do it. And, and if you're like, I want you to leave here today with some, some ways to know God's will. Uh, God's will for you is give thanks in all things. Avoid sexual immorality. Pick up your cross and follow Jesus, and do good. That's God's will for you. And the Bible will confirm those things. The Bible will speak those things to us. All right, number two. Inner witness is also, it's the peace of God. Philippians 4, 6 says, don't worry about anything. That's also God's will for you. Instead, pray about everything. That's also God's will for you. Tell God what you need. Thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace. Which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Now we hit on peace in the Fruit of the Spirit series. But, but look at this. When you feel God's peace, it's a sign that you're in his will. There could be chaos. The things that you thought would work out might not be working out how you thought, right? There might be hardship. There could be opposition. There could be trials and difficulty. But peace in the midst of those things is a really good sign that you're in God's will. See, well, that doesn't make sense. When I'm in God's will, I should feel like warm and fuzzy. Honestly, I think you feel the opposite of warm and fuzzy the more that you're in the center of God's will. Uh, you know, Jesus didn't feel warm and fuzzy through most of his ministry, and I think if you want to make a difference for the kingdom, you won't feel warm and fuzzy. You'll feel peace. As you go through the things that God allows you to go through. And he's with you through those things. And, and it was a hard decision for our family last year to decide to, to come to Adobe, to leave a church. We started uh, from scratch with no people in a community that over eight plus years we had great influence. A church that loved us. Man, I've never been anywhere where people loved me uh, as much. And, and maybe my house, but even not even all the time. And, uh, and, and over those years, I had opportunities to leave some really great church uh, opportunities that called. And, and every time we asked the question, is this God's will, Amanda didn't have peace about it. Uh, and sometimes your spouse needs to be your Holy Spirit because your emotions are too strong. Like I was ready to go before God was ready to go and she was ready to go. So, so we'd have this conversation 
when things would come up, and, and every single time would be a red light, full stop, don't even entertain it, that's not God's will. And so we didn't pursue those opportunities, and then in coming here, I asked Amanda, hey, do you think our time in Rio Vista might be coming to an end? It was the first time in eight and a half years. She said yes. She said, yeah, I think it might be literally the day I looked at what churches were open was the day that this church's listing came online. And so something changed, right? We felt a different piece about transition. And so that's what, what that inner witness looks like, right? Sometimes you just know it's not what you're supposed to do, and then maybe there's a release and it changes and you have peace about what that is. And, and so that's what inner witness is. The next one is personal desires. Now, this one's, we gotta be careful because sometimes your personal desires are in direct conflict with the will of the Lord and you want to do what you wanna do. And you're like, well, he said my personal desires are from the Lord. Everyone here today has some things that you want to do. You have personal desires. Psalm 37 verse four says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Okay, so the Lord comes first in that one. Proverbs 10, 24. What the wicked dreads will come upon him, but the desire of the righteous will be granted. If you delight in the Lord, if you're a righteous follower of Christ, the things that you want will take place in your life. And so the will of God affirms the things that you desire when your desires come from the Lord. Uh, right? Like, oh, I can't just manufacture whatever I want. God will do it. No, there's no such thing as manifesting your existence despite what your vision or dream words might say uh, when you were a kid. And, and so, right, like who you are, who God created you to be, God will use that and the desires that come with that. Uh, I've always been an entrepreneurial kind of person. When I was a kid, I resold candy bars. I started, they were like on sale for a quarter at Safeway. So we'd buy them all up and we'd undercut school prices, which were a dollar. Uh, it was a great system. And I expanded through my brother into the middle school and then he got caught and we all got in trouble. And then I, that. I started a lawn business where I had my brothers work for me. Uh, it was, it was great. I oversaw the work taking place. Uh, when we left our youth pastor position, I made about $12,000 playing Madden on PlayStation 3, just selling digital content to people. Uh, I made more than I made as a youth pastor when I was playing Madden for three, three months. Uh, I have an online arbitrage and sports card flipping side business. Uh, we started a new church. Like I, I love to start new things. I like to take broken systems and, and make them better. The things that I love to do, uh, right, that, that give me life, they're hardwired into how God made me to be. And there's things like that for you. There's things that you were created to do that are life-giving, that you're good at, that you enjoy, that you're skillful at. And, and so your personal desires, some of these things that are submitted to the Lord are a really powerful thing in your life. And God created you that way because he has a will for them to be used in your life. But your personal desires apart from the Lord are really destructive. The things that you like that aren't of the Lord will take you away from him. Some desires the Lord has us even lay down. And some he has us lay them down for a season. Say, so would you give that up for me? And other things he redeems for his kingdom. In one of my classes uh, this last year and a half, we read some material that talked about calling. Calling from the Lord, like doing what God has created you to do. And, and calling can be two different ways. There's a vertical call where the Lord says, this is who you are. This is what I want for you to do. Uh, and, and this is what I want from your life. And then there's also a horizontal call. And a horizontal call, sometimes people tell you that you're great at something or they call you to become something, right? We have, I think, a lot of doctors who became doctors because their parents called them into medicine, right? <laughs> well, you gotta get 4.0, you need to do great in school and you need to become a doctor, don't shame the family. And, and so like, okay, that's what I'll do. And, and, and so that happens spiritually as well. Sometimes we do things because someone says, hey, you might be great at this. I see this in you. And, and that's really good. Both are, are valid calls. But sometimes we pursue some personal desires because other people place them 
within us instead of the Lord. And sometimes we think those things might be God, but in reality, a loved one planted it into you. Or if you know the movie like Inception, I, I, the idea of that is awesome. I wish I could just Inception people to do everything I want them to do. And, and sometimes that actually happens to us. Because sometime, somewhere, someone said, hey, I think you should do this, and, and we adopt that truth, and maybe it wasn't a truth of the Lord. And so personal desires, when, when it comes to this, the list of seven, uh, it requires your caution. You should probably start at yellow and ask, is this desire from me or from the Lord? Okay, so that's personal desire. The next one, special guidance. Uh, this is supernatural messaging. So this one can be like literally anything, but also not a lot of things that you think might be. Uh, is that clear enough for you? Like you're super clear on that? Yeah, it's really hard to explain what supernatural guidance uh, or special messaging could be. And so uh, Amanda has the best illustration on this one that I've ever heard. But she's not preaching today, so uh, I will. So I'll give a highlight of her story, and I'm sure she'll work it into a message someday. But we were getting ready to to move on from the church we were at in Sacramento as youth pastors, and and trying to discern like God, where do you want us next? What's the next season for us? And we've been there for five years. And, Man, I was walking through the park one day, and like a white rabbit came out of nowhere and just like was hopping along, and it's like Alice in Wonderland, I assume. And so she's just like, "I'll follow this white rabbit." <laughs> so she follows this white rabbit, and then she follows it. It leads her to uh, a homeless man who was in the park there, and uh, and he just out of the blue looks at her and says, I had her write it down so I could quote it for you. Uh, You've been in a season of waiting and that God is preparing the next place that you will go and that he will lead you into the next season of ministry to his people. What? <laughs> like a white rabbit? <laughs> uh, to a mad hatter? Like this? <laughs> Like it immediately registered for her, like this was a word from the Lord, from from the stranger who was just in the park, and the guy like just read her mail. And it's a deposit from the Lord in a supernatural, unexpected place, and, and and so the Lord can tell you whatever He wants to tell you, however He wants to tell it to you. And, and if you go to the Old Testament, Daniel saw writing on a wall, supernatural messaging. A, a donkey talked to Balaam. And, and so, right, like, God can communicate to you in any different type of way. And he can communicate his will. And sometimes he uses unorthodox, supernatural ways. Uh, that also doesn't mean that everything you infer into something that happens is a supernatural message from the Lord, uh, right? There, there's some extremes, and so you need to just know what the way God speaks to you so you can understand it. I've heard a person say God reveals things to her via license plates on cars. Um, and I don't know about that. The Lord's never spoke to me through a license plate, but he can speak to someone through anything. So for her, that works. And, and so I want to encourage you to just be open to however the Lord might do that through you. Uh, we had a friend who was a youth evangelist, and, uh, and he would come to this area. His name was Yanni, and uh, great guy. He told me this story one time. He was in a coffee shop, and he was sitting at a counter, and there was a man at a booth behind him, and he felt like the Spirit of the Lord said, hey, I want you to go nibble on that man's ear. <laughs> Not the kind of special message you're not looking for, Lord. <laughs> and so he's... He feels like it's the Lord, and he's arguing with the Lord, like, no, I'm not doing that. That's crazy. And uh, and so eventually, he goes back and forth. He, he feels like the, that God's just saying, you need to go do this. And so he goes to the booth. He nibbles on this guy's ear and just stands there. Like, I'm not going to get punched in the face. What's going to happen? And immediately, the man just starts crying, like weeping profusely. And he sits down, and... And the guy said, listen, uh, however many months or weeks ago, I, I lost my wife, and she used to sit in this booth with me, and she would nibble on my ear just like that. And I was getting ready today to end it all because I was hopeless, and I told God I needed a sign. So they spent time talking, and so listen, 
that there's all kinds of ways. You don't know why you're doing what God tells you to do, but if the Lord's telling you to do it, it's his will for some reason. And, and sometimes if you miss the Lord and you nibble on someone's ear, <laughs> you're going to get punched in the face. So try to know what the Lord's will is and, and what his voice sounds like. Maybe that's a different sermon series I've heard the voice of the Lord. Supernatural messaging, right? Special guidance. Sometimes the Lord just deposits something. The next thing is circumstances. Uh, my time at the church in Sacramento had come to an end. We felt like our time was done. We were interviewing at other churches, and my time ended there like this. I led a trip to Africa with some students. I came home. It took us 64 hours from the time we started leaving to actually get home. Broken planes, misconnection. Like, it was a nightmare. Parents calling, like, where are my children? We're stuck in Africa, but don't worry, we're safe. And... Uh, <laughs> And so all this was leading up to my last Sunday, so we land, you know, like late Saturday night. I'm preaching the next day, and it's my final Sunday. I knew it was God's timing, and so I resigned. And so I started looking for new youth pastor jobs. And as we interviewed, it was going well. And, and we went to this church, and we wouldn't even have had to have moved. It was in Sacramento. And the pastor said, you know what? Uh, your preaching is really good. I really like you. You should be a senior pastor. Um, he didn't hire me. So that was a youth job I didn't get. I interviewed for a few other youth positions, and all of them said, man, Sean, you're great. We love you. We would love to hire you. Uh, there's no reason why we shouldn't hire you, but we feel like God is putting the brakes on this. And at the same time, I was volunteering in the youth department at our district office, working on big youth events and leadership stuff, <coughs> just trying to get more youth ministry experience, and I just could not land a job, and it wasn't like I was getting ghosted. They were calling me up. Oh, you're amazing. We're so glad we got to spend time with you, uh, but we won't be spending more time with you. <laughs> <laughs> and so after, I don't know, about nine months of this or so, like we, we go to this church in Vacaville, and uh, I'm still friends with this pastor today, and, and he says, hey, why don't you come preach at a, a youth service for us, which like that's the last step before you get hired. So you're pretty much in by that point, because you don't introduce people to your students if they're not going to be around it. Uh, and so, so I go, I preached this youth service like 25 minutes. They gave me a $1,400 check. Uh, so it's the most I've ever made of preaching a message. Like, you didn't know that my rate was about $3,000 an hour. <laughs> I still judge my self worth based on that one time when I did that, that one amount for speaking. And so, so I'm friends with this guy today. He actually supported our church when we went to plant the church. And he said, Sean, I, I want to hire you, but you're not a youth pastor. And by this point, he's like the fourth or fifth guy in this nine-month period to tell me this. And can I tell you, I was sick and tired of people who didn't know me telling me how much they would love to hire me, not hiring me, and then telling me I should be something I wasn't. I, I was over it by that point. But he gave me a big check, so I was like, okay, I'll... <laughs> <laughs> so one day, I, I'm at the district office, uh, I'm leaving, I go out to my car, and the district youth director's out there, and he said, hey, do you ever see yourself as being a lead pastor? And I said, yeah. When I'm grown up, that's probably what I would do one day, not, I was 27 at the time. It's not right now, you know. They, they shouldn't let kids be senior pastors. <laughs> and they shouldn't, man. I made mean, eight years of my mistakes before I came here, so praise the Lord. Uh, and so he said, well, maybe it's worth looking into it. And he didn't know that all these pastors were saying this to me. And so I put together a lead pastor resume, started helping out at a friend's church as an associate pastor. And it was there that I sat in on my first board meetings. Uh, I learned about church finance there. I got to teach my first adult Bible study. And my circumstances through that year helped guide me to eventually understand and recognize the change that God was making in my life. God closed doors at every step. I would have gone to every single one of those churches. And, and in fact, one that really wanted us was this large church. They had all the budgets, all the youth, youth ministry paid staff. And it was like, this is a dream for us. And, and, and the doors just all closed. And, and so it led me eventually to saying the yes to becoming a lead pastor, a thing that, that I wasn't recognizing God doing, but it was through that process, right? It was through the circumstances that, that I was living that God revealed what his will was. 
And that brings us to the last two, which is through that process, I sought mature counsel. Uh, you, you need to have wise counsel in your life. You need some people who've been there longer and done it better. Now, I have an amazing spouse. I have great mentors. I have friends and peers who I can talk through things with. And, and now I get to be that voice for others a bit. And Job 12.12 12 says this. Wisdom belongs to the aged and understanding to the old. If you're the smartest, most mature, best Christ follower in the room, you should find a better room. Now, you need a pastor, uh, you need a friend, those are different roles, by the way, like if we're great friends, then I can't pastor you properly. You need a mentor in your life, you need several voices of mature counsel to help advise you at times, and you should also be that for others. So if Rebecca, you want to come up, um, this, this thing of wise counsel, mature counsel, like you need voices that can speak God's will into your life. Voices that can also challenge when you're out of God's will that you will receive it from them. And so to recap, you can throw the list back up there. Bible, inner witness, personal desire, mature counsel, special guidance, circumstances. And the last one, common sense. We used to live, I think, in a world that had common sense. It abounded in I don't know if that's still normal today. I don't know uh, if, if there's as much common sense anymore because what's become common has changed. And, and so when it comes to this common sense one, you can ask yourself some questions like, does this make sense? What is the wise strategic decision? What's the obvious thing about God's will to this circumstance? What is simple for me to see and understand and with all of these, right, all these seven, you test each one through the light system, and it doesn't mean you need or are going to get seven out of seven green lights. When you understand God's will, like sometimes you're going to get some of them answered and some of them you just have a blank, right? And so you can have four green, two yellow, and some red. Hopefully just one, there's only seven days. And maybe you wait to make a decision. Maybe you say, okay, well, I'm leaning this way, but I'm not quite sure, and so you wait on the Lord. It's, it's why the default is yellow. We wait on the Lord. And testing these seven things out will help guide you to always be in the will of God. And here's the thing. I told you there was going to be a bonus one. These seven things are actually packaged in a really nice bundle uh, and, and that bonus thing is this eighth one. It's not part of the list, but it encompasses all of these things, and it's prayer. Right? You're like, well, I don't know how to discern this, this, or this. Well, it's through prayer that you hear from the Lord and understand His voice. And so you didn't vote for it, but next week we're going to talk about prayer and its role of God's will in your life. Okay, so we're going to do a part two of God's will and, and cover this prayer piece. But but I want you to think back to the first question that I asked you this morning. Have you ever felt lost? Have you ever not known what God wanted? Maybe you felt like Chloe did in the trees, right? It feels like you're in a forest, but if you could just back up, if you could see God's view on your situation, you'd see, like, oh, I'm just in the tree farm. There's friendly people all around. There's people waiting and willing to help all over the place. And here's the thing, right? Chloe was okay. And her father, who lost her, thank God our Heavenly Father doesn't lose us. But her father was looking for her. Her father was coming after her, shouting, trying to, to figure out where she was. And, and when we found her, right, there was great joy. And I think it's the same for you. As you seek God's will, as you search for what your father wants, he's coming after you. He's, he's trying to find you. He's trying to, to wrap his arms around you and pick you up and make you feel safe and welcome in his arms. And, and so if you're searching, if you feel like maybe you've been lost in the woods, I want to pray for you today. So just close your eyes. Would you bow your heads? 
team wants to come as we get ready to worship. Lord, there are many in this room today that are in need of some direction. It, it's all type of manner of decisions, Lord, where, where we need you, where we need to understand your will. Because, God, it, it's not our will be done. God, as you work to transform us, we, we just want to please you. Sometimes, God, we feel lost. We don't know how to find your will. We don't know how, how to know if it's you or not. And so, God, for everyone who is here this week that is searching, that is unknown about something, they're, they're asking these big questions. God, who am I? What did you create me to become? What do you want me to do with this stage of my life? You might have already lived a career, and God's saying, now I want something different. Lord, we want to be open and obedient to your call. And what you might have for us. And Lord, the first thing to knowing your will is we've got to have your spirit within us. And so if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, I want to give you that opportunity to surrender your life to him. To say, God, would you come into to my life and lead me? Would you save me? Would you forgive me of my sin? And if that's you and you're here today, would you just raise your hand so I can pray for you? If you haven't done that... You say, I, I want to know God's will, but I need to know Jesus first. Secondly, is this, you're here today, and you would just say to the Lord, God, I need some clarity in one of these seven areas. I'm faced with this decision or these decisions. You God, I want to do your will, but I need to hear from you. I need you to, to change some light colors up for me so that I can understand what you're trying to do. And if that's you and you're here, would you just raise your hand so I can pray for you today? Thank you. Thank you. God, for all the hands, you know what we need to do. And you know your will for us. And so, God, I pray we would take these seven things and even today or, or this week, God, we would run them through the light system and, and we write it down and we, we take survey of where you're at and where we're at with you. And God, I pray that there would be activity, that you would reveal your will to us through these things, these ways that you operate and move in our life. God, we can't do it without you. We need you, Lord. And so, God, I pray that you would reveal yourself and your will to your people. We pray this in Jesus' name.